Hi, everybody. Oh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. What a wonderful way to spend our Christmas holiday here. I can't think of a better way. I'm just so excited to be here with all of you and and I just really feel all of your hearts. It's really true that we're we're one mind. Can I can I could just feel the the importance and the the sacredness of us all coming together in this way and calling upon the spirit to bring illumination and we're calling on it so strong. We want this to be the most direct, uh, accelerated pathway to, to God, going inward in our own mind. So I just wanted to say that I feel you all, and, and again, I have spent some of the day just reading through your expressions and your questions and your prayers, and uh, it's just so intimate to to feel what you're really expressing and I know that you can feel free to just pour it out to me so I am actually just honored to be able to go through and to read these things that you've written and then uh, then to come on and to see all your your faces just amazing like we're all in, in one quantum digital room together and we all are going to be transparent and and really go for it and I have to say too um yeah, Greg handed me the participant list uh, for this retreat, and in going through it, um, all the new participants are marked in green here, and so I think I think we have over 20 uh, new participants, and the current count is 111. So it's all synchronized for us here. We're, we're a gathering of 111, 111 to open up to our oneness in Christ. And um, I just wanted to take time to welcome all of you, and especially to the new ones that have chosen to join us. Chantel Horst from Australia, Della from Australia, Udestra, oh, Udestra, I remember visiting you, you hosted me in your house, and uh, it's so beautiful that you're here with us, and I know this is going to be an amazing weekend. Stephen Anthony from Canada, we've got uh, Elenique, Mikkel, Klaus from, yeah, Karaka, Denmark, Finland, it just the list goes on and on. Japan, Netherlands, a lot of people from all over the world and quite a few from uh, the United States. There's Sweden in there. I feel like this is going to be very profound because we are really going to try to make the lesson very, very, very simple. Uh, Sometimes people talk about there's so many lessons to learn in this lifetime and we learn from A Course in Miracles. It's not really what it seems to be. Number one, it's not, it's not actually, it's a, it's not a real lifetime, it's a dream life, life and, and it doesn't matter whether you talk about birth or death or past lives or future lives, it's just a dream. And then there is one lesson and that is to see the, the dream, perceive it differently, see it with new eyes, to come to a higher perspective and have a shift in your mind on the perspective of the dream. And it doesn't have anything to do with multiple lessons or complexity. It's actually extremely simple. So I, I know tonight, at the beginning of this movie retreat weekend, um, we're all looking forward to seeing the movie tomorrow, and we really want to set it up with you about this this one lesson that we have to get, because if we can really focus in on what the lesson is, then I think you'll find that when you watch the movie, you're going to see that movie reflecting a huge opportunity that could save you thousands of years, so to speak, in, in terms of spiritual awakening. It, it will literally collapse time. So, 
I'm going to pass it down to Frances Zhu down in, in Mexico now, and she's got something to share about. We have a lot of translators uh, that are with us who translated, put the subtitles into many languages uh, for this movie that we're going to watch this weekend. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, David. And uh, welcome to, to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us this weekend. And uh, yeah, David... Um, mention some names um, of you who just signed up for the first time to our online retreat. And I actually want to mention some of you who actually helped um, translating Take Me Home into your native language because it feels very, very intimate. And some of you I've never met before. And yet we have in this same journey for this this seeming time and tap into this, this, this deep love together with a project for forgiveness. So I just want to extend this warm welcome for spending time with us this weekend and for my huge gratitude for you. So Julie from Canada, Katerina, Katerina from Austria, Colin from China, Mirka and Stephanie from Finland, Anna Sevi from Greece, Eddie from Japan, Anna from Guatemala, Mario Lane from Netherlands, um, Car Carolina from Poland, Eva Britt and Sylvia from Sweden. Thank you so much for being here with us and for for all you have given to the movie already and for still coming here to spend time to join this way. So, yeah, I'm so grateful. And, uh, yeah, like David said, this weekend, you know, the reason we want to show the movie in the context of the retreat is because the movie it itself um, is very experiential. It's not... There isn't a lot of exp explanation in how to perceive it and what are the important lessons. It's very, very experiential. And, and you probably will notice tomorrow as well, it doesn't really focus too much on the ego or the drama of life, the, the conflicts. It, they're there, but the movie is pointing to a solution. And I think this is why we really want to use the movie as a tool to come together because we want to use our time to focus on the solution and time is best used in that way. And I think we have... You know, so many problems we can think about. Look at the days in our lives in this world. There are so many problems and so many issues, and they can be solved at one time and seem to come back again. But I feel this is a time together in this very weekend between Christmas and New Year we are going to join together in our mind to focus on nothing else but the solution. And it's very symbolic because uh, Susanna mentioned to me today that, that today is the first day of the last final lesson in A Course in Miracles. Um, starting today, there are only five days left of the year, five lessons left and they're all exactly the same. So, so it's just the same symbol that many becomes one. And uh, yeah, and I feel we all have called for something very, very deep. We want a very deep message, very direct message as an answer to this call for love in, in the mind. And um, this is what we're here for. So this, this today we're just going to um, give some context about really what what spirit want us to hear 
at this particular moment? What is his answer to the call for love? You know, we want to just start getting into it. And uh, tomorrow morning, um, many of you have sent in questions. We have a very thick, <laughs> very thick paper um, binder of questions. But tomorrow we thought these questions um, are more like practical applications of, of the universal lesson. You know, when we, when we get clear about the lesson, then we can really talk also about some kind of practical applications. And the movie in the afternoon will be so well set up because then you will be able to really watch the movie and receive it to see um, how the spirit answer the call for love in the most practical way and what is our part and what is his part and our part is very very small and i i think tomorrow i will also get a, a little bit more into um all the lessons that the spirit presented to us throughout the, the process um and also sunday morning we will have um a q and a session because um today is actually this weekend is the first time the first online retreat for take me home and we actually can gather pretty much everybody who can come here to to be here and we have a lot of people who are part of the project all along who are sitting right here behind the camera in the camera studio, but um, who are in Spain. These people have been behind the, the project, have been in front of the camera, and the whole cast will be here on Sunday to, to share their experience where, where they are now and uh, answer all of your questions. And of course, David will be here throughout the weekend to just be able to, you know, to really focus on the, 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 the one lesson that, that the spirit want us to focus on this weekend. So it will be really, really profound. I'm just so excited for this time together. So. Thank you, Francis. Oh, this yeah. is so exciting. It's very exciting because we're going to kind of, we're in a zoom room and we're going to zoom, zoom, zoom in on, uh, on the problem and which allows us then to zoom, zoom, zoom to the answer. Uh, some of you who have studied A Course in Miracles know that uh, that's the major theme throughout the course is that the, your one problem, uh, which is the belief in separation, has already been solved. But as Jesus tells us in Workbook Lessons 79 and 80, that it doesn't really help you that it's already been solved. If you are misdefining the problem, you can't really accept the answer. So as long as you're confused about what the problem is, then you can't accept the Holy Spirit. And once you get clear on what the problem is, then all of a sudden the answer becomes obvious and then uh, there there is no problem. So. We have people here that are very new. Uh, I believe it was um, Anne Diliberti up in New York. Uh, she wrote. She wrote so many questions. It was almost like a miniature book. I think it's uh, the the. It was so articulated that it's probably bigger than this little book I have of Khalil Gibran's called The Prophet. It's a it's a it's a whole book of questions. And yet I could feel the love and the sincerity behind the questions. It's like, please help me understand, help me get clear on this. So if you've watched any of my videos over the last year or two, you'll find that I'm talking about only mastery through love. You can't master anything through fear. You find that I'm talking about that the the problem is a problem in the mind. There are no physical illnesses, there are no physical problems. Everything is a mental problem because the belief in separation is in the mind. It's, it's not in the body, it's not in form, it's not in time and space. And 
over the years, I've said over and over and over in these talks I've shared that you must learn, learn one thing, that guilt is always totally unnecessary. There is never a reason to feel guilty. Guilt is always totally unnecessary. And yet, Jesus tells us that you are innocent in eternity and you feel guilty in time because time itself is like the flypaper that caught the fly. It's the, it's the stickiness of the ego. It's a projection of the belief in separation. So it's important to realize, and I say this over and over, that you are not responsible for the error, but you are responsible for accepting the correction for the error. You are responsible for joining with Jesus and the Holy Spirit and overlooking the error. Or, uh, I think Eric just posted one of my uh, recent talks, Do Not See Error. You know, that's the highest, the highest training of the mind is to teach you to be so aligned with the Spirit that you simply cannot perceive error anymore. You're not always trying to first perceive something and then figure out a way to wipe it clean or to erase it or to delete it, but you can join so fully into your right mind, into the atonement, that you literally do not perceive error. You don't perceive error. You, you aren't looking for error in time and space. Uh, one of the things I used early on in my practice was I needed simple little phrases in my mind and any time I would see anything amiss anywhere in the world, uh, I would hear Jesus in my mind in a very simple, playful way. He would just say to me, uh, you spot it, you got it. You know, he makes it rhyme, you know, so I won't forget it. You spot it, you got it. You spot a problem, you got a problem. You spot an error, you got an error. You spot a mistake, you're mistaken. The, there's the error, the belief in separation is what we could call specialness. We could call comparison, we can call it judgment, we could call it the ego, call it separation, call it anything you want. But this little speck in the mind of the belief in specialness projects out all of time and space. So to believe that you are here in time and space, to believe that you are in time and space is what specialness is. So you're not going to be cleaned of specialness inside of time and space. Of course, the only solution to specialness is the holiness of the correction, the Holy Spirit in, your, in the right mind. So, what we're going to focus on here is that, that every time you perceive uh, something gone wrong, a mistake, an error, something that's, a, a, something that's dark, something that's, a, you call it a sin, whatever you perceive, it's just that you're looking through a darkened glass and you're just avoiding seeing that it's a perceptual problem, that the only thing you have to do to experience the correction is you first must see that you are having a perceptual problem. You're perceiving a fragmented world. It doesn't matter how you shift that world around, it doesn't matter how you rearrange the script, no matter how many times you rearrange relationships and jobs and situations, and you keep going around and around and around like a kaleidoscope, that is all an avoidance of accepting the correction in this very moment. And so, even when you're concerned about something in the future, you may lose something dear to you in the future. Jesus tells us in the immediacy of salvation section of, of the Course, he says, future loss is not your fear, your real dread is present joining. So we're going to really focus on that lesson of what it means to be truly joined in purpose. What it means to be truly joined in mind. In your mind is where the healing occurs. In your mind is where the collaboration with the Holy Spirit occurs. 
In your mind is where the unifica unification of perception occurs. And when you project it out from this moment in your mind, when you project it to time and space, you see that you have invented a world, or the ego has put out an invented world of situations, financial situations, relationship situations, situations with the environment, with, with parents and children, situations with, with the body, and all kinds of trillions of different problems that are, that are all situational problems. In fact, I've said it many years, I've said, you know, the one problem is this situational thinking. If you keep thinking in terms of boxes, in terms of situations, which is really all that seems to be in time and space, you can't possibly accept a correction. You need to go quantum, you need to go into a, see it's all mind and it's all mind equally, it's all mind completely. There is no problem apart from the mind. At the beginning, you will notice there is enormous temptation to try to solve the many problems that Francis was talking about. Every day, you solve problems, more problems arise. Solve some problems, more problems. But the answer, the simple, direct answer, is that you have the power in your mind to let go of searching and trying to correct and define and figure out and fix the world. You can actually come back into your mind and give yourself permission to just step back and look at the world with the Holy Spirit in a completely new way. So we tonight, Francis and I really want to explore that with you because as you watch this movie tomorrow, Take Me Home, you know, you you have your own movie that you're watching called Daily Life. You have your own story that's been evolving over years, over decades. You have your own repeating problems and, and you'll see in the movie, uh, you'll see that all is offered. Every scene of the movie is just an opportunity to let go of trying to define the problem in terms of the world. In fact, when Francis and I were in San Rafael, we, we were really honored to, to be there in Judith Scutch. She's one of the original fours, Judy and Ken and Helen and Bill. And we were in Judith Scutch's uh, place and house and we, we watched the movie with her and she was sitting right to my left and I remember the first thing she said to me after she watched the movie was, she said, I could see myself in all of those characters and all of those situations. That's the beginning of the dawning of forgiveness, when you can start to see yourself. You can start to see the sameness of everything that's occurring. Because literally, everything that we perceive is coming from our mind. Francis, what do you think about that? How do we convey this simplicity? <laughs> That's amazing. I actually want to uh, like throw out something very radical because because um, there is a line in the course Jesus actually talk about sickness and healing, and I know this is something very practical. People sometimes um, have questions about that, but he actually throw just a line there, basically saying healing does not occur at that level. Now, what he is saying is either you heal all sickness or not at all. And that is, that is how radical that is. So healing happens when we actually heal all sickness. And that to the ego is an impossible task. It's giant, it's impossible, but to the spirit, it isn't. It is, it is a diminishing of a thought system, if we so choose. But I just want to give that as an example of the kind of, the kind of confusions 
that we have sometimes because when we talk about healing, we zoom into the world. Like David was talking about situations, situations. How do I fix this? How do I fix this symptom? How do I go about that thought? And, and here he is saying, okay, there is a place that none of this exists and you can come to this place and see this world with me from this place. And that's why he calls it, we relive the same instant and we relearn the same lesson over and over and over and over again. So in that way, if we really look at life, our life, it's not, let's not be deceived by the surface and the the seeming different phases of our life, the seeming different relationships we're in, faces, you know, there is, is there really a difference to, to, to the spirit, to Jesus? He's saying, you're living this same instant and you're learning perfection over and over and over again because you haven't mastered this lesson. And this lesson is the lesson to learn to, to, to see your brother innocent, to see that there is innocence that you can perceive from in your own mind. So I just feel like that is exactly what we want to talk about um, this weekend because, because, you know, Jesus also says this, this in, the, in the workbook or manual for teachers. He says, um, we, to give up all the problems in the world for one answer is to reverse the thinking of the, the world. And that alone can be called faithfulness. So that's what he was saying. He was, he was saying, okay, you know, it's good to go that direction to start to ask Jesus. But before long, you will realize he is the answer to absolutely everything, absolutely every single problem. And if we don't try to define the problem as we perceive it and put them all into the same category. Okay, sickness, sickness, there's no difference between different symptoms and there's no difference between sickness and health and relationships and attack thoughts and anything. So they're all representing the same problem, which is separate situations and the lack of love. And um, that is really the core, the core lesson that, that Jesus wants us to, to start thinking along those lines. And only to, to that point, when we start to accept, okay, maybe that is so. Maybe that is so. Maybe I don't have to keep analyzing every situation, then we will be ready to ask, ask him for, for the same answer over and over again. Remember, we are just, that's, that's what time is for. We're learning this lesson over and over and over again. And I feel, you know, with, with um, the movie, Take Me Home and with the spiritual journey, I feel that to the extent we can really see the simplicity of the lesson, that's where everything starts to make sense. You know, when I really see everything in this world from, from this perspective, okay, there is only one lesson. And Jesus actually put relationships and teaching learning situations you know in as the same way same thing to, he talks about these two as if they're the same so he basically is saying that when we come together with someone 
either it's very, very brief encounter, as brief as a child ran into us without looking and then ran away, as brief as, as that, or as significant as is a lifelong relationship or family, or it's someone that you actually think of in your mind. They are really only for one purpose. It is to teach and learn this one lesson over and over again, a lesson of innocence. But the lesson is not learned through effort. It's not learned by trying to be a better person or trying to be something else. The lesson is learned through asking Jesus for perspective, for new percep perception. So when I realized that, I thought, well, then all relationships in this world make sense to me now. Not only all relationships, everything, everything makes sense to me because my relationship with everything makes sense to me now. And I understand why you know, there is still a need to perfect this lesson. Why situations seem to still be here is really just to learn this, to teach and learn this one lesson. So that is the, the kind of setup that we want to start zooming into from here, you know, with the way that, you know, the spiritual journey goes with Take Me Home, um, we have a few of us who come together feel called to put a movie together. Originally, it was coming from an inspiration, a dream I had, but it, it took a lot of us who heard the call at the same time to come together. And what, what did we really come together for was the real question. You know, we in the in the eyes of the world, we came here to make a movie for a purpose that the ego normally don't ask. He doesn't ask, why do you do this? Why do you put a movie together? For what? This kind of question is something that the ego doesn't focus on. He wants us to get into doing. He wants us to get into thinking about the future, produce an end result. So... When we, when we came together for this movie, um, we really asked this one question, like, what was this really about? And what did we, what do we come together for? And, um, as I said earlier, you know, we always come together for one, of two purposes, whether either we come for ego's purpose or for the spirit's purpose. And the spirit's purpose is, is this one lesson. We come together to learn this one lesson together over and over and over again by calling on the spirit, which is the innocence in our mind, which has the solution to unify all the perceptions. So that is what we got clear from the beginning of the project. Are we here to use the project for healing? Are we here to decide to hear one voice in all situations, no matter what comes up? Yes. Are we here to use only prayer to make all practical decisions moving forward? Yes, because in that our purpose are, are extremely unified, and we're all here to say we're just to hear um, to heal our fragmented perception because we don't know how to perceive, we don't know how to be with each other, we don't know how to do anything in this world. But here we got very, very solid with a very clear purpose to start with. So, yeah, so I think we can just. Yeah, David, I don't know whether you have more to chip in or should I keep going mm -hmm. with? <laughs> yeah, I can share a little bit more. I think, you know, 
it relates to this whole idea that if if God is the creator and Christ is a perfect creation of a loving God, and then if we call God the the cause and Christ the effect, then you start to see that that we live and move and have our being in God, and it's impossible to be apart from spirit. That's the fact of it. That's the reality of it. And then. This world is is a denial of the fact, and so that's why we have to forgive it. But also, uh, recently a, a gentleman from uh, Europe, Stig, wrote to me, and he was working with this idea of cause and effect, and you start to realize that that all of the projections, all of the situations, all of the roles, everything we have believed in, everything that we feel guilty about, not being good enough, not being good enough at doing this or that, not fulfilling the roles that the ego set up for us. It's like a, a game of guilt. It's all coming from the belief that, that we can leave our source and that, that we can be something other than an idea in the mind of God. And in A Course in Miracles, in the clarification of terms, it's interesting where Jesus, you know, he talks about spirit, and spirit is just, you know, pure love and light. It's just divinity. And then he mentions the mind is the activating agent of spirit. In other words, if we're going to remember that we're purely light and purely spirit, we need to use our mind as the activating agent, meaning we can't play mindless, we can't get all caught up in a dream world where everything is an idol meant to deny that we're spirit. So any role we play, any situation that we judge, apart from any other situation, all of that projection is one big denial of the truth of who we are. And we're not even going to have a chance, an opportunity to come back to that spirit that we are, the I am presence, without the activating agent of the mind. So to me, I think this is so exciting because all Jesus is really telling us is, don't see the world so split up and fragmented. You need to see it in holistic terms. You need to have it all embraced, all wrapped up together uh, in your mind in order to to let it go. You're not going to let it go if you believe it's real and you still are tinkering around with the tinker toys. If you've got fantasies and idle images and things that you're trying to work out, Somehow you're trying to solve like a Rubik's Cube of the world and it's just not going to work. You need to come back to a holistic point of view. See the whole. And that's where the peace is found. It's interesting, Francis and I have participated in these things. We call them six-week devotionals over in Majorca over the years. And um, people actually take time out of their worldly lives to come and be with us for six weeks at a time. So it's like a six weeks little mini live-in experiment. Uh, very exciting. Because uh, people come from all over the world, they come to an island, like going to Gilligan's Island or something, go to New York, and then you're there. And then when they land and they come in, they're like, okay, what's the agenda? We don't have one. What's the, what's the program? We don't have one. Well, what are we going to do for six weeks? We'll find out. What it is, is giving yourself over to a dismantling of, of what you believe yourself to be. All the familiar roles, you know, they're still in the mind, but when you seem to come away, even spatially, from some of those familiar situations, you just it's like an opportunity to just say, Maybe I'm not the thing I thought I was. Maybe there's a way I can join together in this moment through guidance to collaborate, to be shown, to tap into my guidance, to be inspired, to be able to laugh together and cry and relate and emote and come together in a way that takes me higher and higher toward this holistic experience that is so glorious and so amazing. So, 
for me, it's very important when I read all of your questions and I read through your prayers, I, I really see that what you are calling for is help me be guided to go through a process or through an experience that seems to be the dismantling of the self-image or the self-concept or the personality self and world that I believe to be real. Help me let that morph, let that start to fall apart. In science, you know, there's, there's the concept of entropy, which is basically everything's moving towards this destruction and dismantling. Everything in time and space. And yet, the ego says, oh, I don't think that's going to hold on very well. If, if that's all there is to this world is just falling apart, uh, that won't keep your attention very long. That's why we need... The ego invents all kinds of fantasies and false goals and idols and things to pursue in this world, thinking that you're moving forward, you're acquiring, you're collecting, you're possessing, you're accumulating, and really it's all just entropy. Everything's falling apart, falling back to the wholeness, falling back to the completion, falling back to the stillness. And it's only the attempts to hold on to goals of this world, form goals, that, that blocks us from just simply surrendering and letting everything, you might say, collapse and be reorchestrated or reassembled into a holistic, right-minded view of the world. So this is exciting because Frances can tell you that even for her to have that dream to take on to do this movie, to trust that everybody would show up, all the, the everything she would need for it, all the people and everything, just for the purpose of healing, that holistic perception, that's really what's underneath this whole movie. And I would say it's underneath every movie. Every movie that we seem to watch is just a call to have it reordered, like shown to us by the Holy Spirit in a holistic way, and all problems are non-existent in this holistic perception. It's really exciting. You know, this is so exciting that this is available. That's what this weekend is really about. Yeah, and I think if if anything um, that that this movie can offer, of course, I think it, it probably can offer a lot of things because it's a, a, a peek into um, the look, what the healing journey would look, look like when, when you really give yourself over to it, when you really open yourself up um, and decide to just go for it, to be transparent, um, to follow your calling, what, what it would look like. And sometimes it's much better shown than tell. So that definitely um, can help with that. But also, if anything, I feel the movie, I hope it is of a message about the, the effortlessness for us and how much the spirit will orchestrate everything. And because that is truly the lesson that I have received through this process and I hope that somehow there will be a way that can be this can be conveyed because you know I, I feel there is um, this this the energy of wanting to strive to, to an end goal um, that is very ingrained in the ego you know wanting even for the spiritual journey we wanted to reach the end goal to become happy or become whatever but but the the spirit's curriculum is extremely different different it aims for a present goal and the present goal is achieved effortlessly if we so choose that is so beyond the grasp of the ego it's so simple that is too simple to grasp by the ego anymore the ego is saying, no, no, it, it, it's, not, it's not that because it, 
is not here. But what I invite all of you to really join me is to accept that this goal is a present goal and is simple and is present because it is still inside. It is simple because it is still inside of us, because it is us. So when we decide to choose present peace, you know, it is not a battle. Peace, peace, come to me. I don't feel peace. It, it, this is not the way that you really choose peace. It feels like all this turmoil in the mind. At one point, you're just like, ah, I just give myself a moment. And you will see how simple peace come back to you in that moment. And like I said, it is truly just as simple as that. And it's a repetition of the same lesson until we master it. And I think for, for this movie from the beginning of when I received the dream or the vision till right now, actually it's exactly um, eight years I mean, actually, it's funny because right now is the end of 2019. We finished it in this year. We finished the movie this year, and and now we're we're having our first showing as the ending of the year um, online. So it it feels really really profound for me because I from the beginning when I received the vision, when I received the dream, it was effortless. I didn't manufacture it. I didn't try to come up with a dream or inspiration. It it came out of just a very genuine desire to want to somehow give what I have received, the hope, the kind of light that I, I, I feel in my mind. And then from that moment on till now, if there is one lesson I feel I really want to share is this lesson. I need to do nothing. Spirit, this holy instant, do I give to you? Be you in charge? That is truly the lesson and the gift because, you know, when, when we start to do anything, we start to think if we're not in control, everything will fall apart. But that is the wrong way of thinking and also, I think in the ego's world, the, the thought system put a lot of emphasis on the doing, but very, very rarely it will tell us you can think differently. And if you think differently, you will have what you want. That kind of teaching is, has never been, you know, has never come to us from the ego's perspective. So I think for this for me for this project it was a long period of time to learn that it is never about doing anything and it is always always about the way i think and it's not to change the way i think as an effort but to forgive and let go of my way of thinking. Truly, truly forgiveness is the only word, the only lesson. And I'm so glad that A Course in Miracles will come with such a thick book. And in the end, it says, you know, that is the end of this curriculum. The aim is forgiveness. And from this point on, you know, you are you're in good hands you're in the spirit's hands because you know how to forgive now that's all once you know how to forgive once you know the benefit of forgiveness you don't need learning anymore there is no curriculum anymore so this project was just one of the many projects i would say and one of the many relationships that that along this healing path, 
And now it is used as an example to showcase another way of thinking and another way of doing and also another way of relating to each other and to ourselves. And what is, you know, you know, in relationships, we have this, this um, fear of loss. We have this devastation when things change, when, you know, things shift and people leave and the roles change. There is a lot of perception of um, abandonment, uh, about rejection. There is a lot of belief that tied into that. And I, I'm actually uh, dare to say that this, this path and A Course in Miracles will undo all of that. You will walk away forever not a victim of the belief of abandonment and rejection anymore. And this movie actually shows a way to do that. It shows a way that if, if our purpose is so clear, you know, we're not thinking we want to make a movie that looks good. We want to have some a good time together we want to form friendship we also and we have so many different goals if we don't we we wipe away all the goals and just saying there is one goal and one goal only and this goal is to use this project to get in touch with this present peace and the spirit within and that's the the only goal then we use all our meetings and all our decision makings and all the emotions. There are a lot of emotions that come up when we come together, first seeming strangers, um, to, to, to do something concrete. There are a lot of emotions, but all those emotions and expressions are all used for the same purpose. Then we can let go of all the other goals. And then in the end, the movie did get made, made, you know, we, we did have um, a very deep relationship and bond together, but that is, that is not the, the, even the true lesson, you know, the true lesson is what we are forever. We let go and we forgive some of the very, very deep, the deep beliefs that we at one time believed to be true and not anymore. And that is the gift of, of the project. And that's the gift of any project if we use for this particular purpose. So. Yeah. And I think it's so beautiful to realize that the direction we're moving into um, is so pristine and so innocent and so humble that, of course, that would be the experience we would have in the presence of, of God's love. No pride, no sense of a mask, no sense of an agenda, no sense of, of a linear goal, trying to make something happen, trying to fix something. It's, it's a total opening and a washing. So when you watch this movie, you'll get to see all the characters are going through a washing. They, they want to be right. They think they know something. They think they're good at something. They, all the things, even the positive things of this world are all inventions of the ego. Positive attributes are the opposite of negative attributes. And what we're learning from the Course is that the positives and the negatives are all part of a trick to keep us from the wholeness that we are, which is, which is neither positive nor negative. Imagine, imagine that, that you go into any, any project or collaboration or relationship with the sole desire to be rinse free of all of the concepts and the roles. When you look at relationships there's all these categories, you know, are, are, they, are they together or are they not? I mean, when you go to fill out forms, 
uh, for applications, you know, they say single or married. There's no single or married in heaven. Uh, male or female? No. There isn't male or female in heaven. You know, uh, do you have children? No children? No, no, no. These are not N.A., not applicable. These, Jesus is putting N.A. to every single thing on the form. Not applicable, not applicable, not applicable. Why? Because you're a spirit. You're not any of those concepts. Now, but if you're, if you're already addicted to those concepts and you believe you're male or female or you believe you're married or single or divorced or widowed or any of those crazy categories that really are not applicable, the Holy Spirit and Jesus will not rip anything away from you. But as you give yourself over to this collaboration of function and, and listen and follow, all of those things are going to get more rinsed and washed. Because in the end, you aren't a category. You cannot be defined at all. You, you are not a category. You were created perfect by God. How could you now be a category? That's why it's not applicable. Now, of course, the ego says, oh, don't get too uh, crazy here. You know, you still have to survive. The body still has to survive. But what if you had such a great trust in your heart that instead of putting your investing in terms of money and stocks and bonds and investments in, in terms of purchases and possessions and everything, what if you just went, maybe I've been going in the wrong direction with all of that, Maybe I just need faith. Maybe I need true faithfulness. Maybe I need to be lifted and carried back. You know, love lift us up where we belong, the Joe Cocker song. I, what if I need to soar in the heavens? I need to soar in expansiveness. And it's all these categories and concepts and boxes and roles and false responsibilities that are weighing me down, that are keeping me down keeping my emotions down, keeping me feel down, just depressed, when actually I'm meant to soar into the heavens, into a state of mind of perfect wholeness and completion and oneness. So the Holy Spirit exchanges self-concepts, you know. I went to university, I studied things, I had jobs and co-op. I never could quite get a career going in this world. It was almost like some part of my mind knew, that's a joke. That's, got, that's a joke that the Son of God would have a career. It's a joke to think that t time can come to circumvent eternity. It's a joke to think that the Son of God is a traveler through time and space when time and space were made up by the ego and the Son of God is pure spirit. We have to let go of this amnesia of guilt where we're, we're caught up playing all these roles. And so when I made contact with Jesus and I just started to just listen, he was saying, I'm calling you out of this world. You are, he says in the Course, you are mind, you are holy mind, and you are purely mind. Jesus is not a very, would not be a popular speaker at mind, body, spirit festivals, because why? The spirit's real, the divine mind is real, and the body's not. He's not going to try to com combine things that cannot be combined. The body is an illusion. How can you combine illusions with the truth? You can't. So, in the end, we're going on a journey of faithfulness. When you watch this movie, we want you to... to have faith and really have the prayer of your heart. Jesus, Holy Spirit, show me what I need to see here. Show me what I need to see. Some of you have been on our Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment, and there was a filmmaker, Guy Ritchie, he used to be married to Madonna, but Guy Ritchie made a, a movie called Revolver. And there's a line in Revolver that I just love, and the line is, Speaking of the ego, the whole movie is about dismantling and releasing the ego. It's, it's a great Hollywood movie based on re releasing the ego. But there's a line in the movie that says, Where you don't want to go, that's where you'll find him. And he's talking about the ego. 
where you don't want to go. That's where you'll find the ego. The place that you avoid the most is where the ego is hiding. And where is this place? It's not really aware. It's your mind. The ego is, is a belief in the mind. It's not, can't be found in time and space. It's, it's like a dark veil that's a filter that you're looking at all of time and space through this filter. But you can't see the filter because it's in your mind. So why have all the great spiritual traditions, many great spiritual traditions say meditate, be still, go within. The answers are all within you. You, you don't have to seek outside yourself because what, what you are searching for is already you. It's already in you. But we have to start to realize that is, like Francis was saying, it's the very search and the attempt to become a better person, a more efficient person, a more likable person, a more popular person, a more wealthy person, a more skilled person, a more achieving person, a more accumulating person, a more evolving person. It can't be found in personhood. Whenever you are trying to improve upon the image that you already believe you are, you are spinning right in the ego's trap. You're like a hamster right on the, ham the ego's hamster wheel. And the more you try to effort, achieve, accomplish, learn more, be more, you are not seeing what Francis was just talking about, like, stop a moment. Relax a moment. I need to do nothing. Spirit will show me everything if I will just stop and relax. I don't even have to be on that hamster wheel. I don't have to keep defining myself by these unreal concepts and responsibilities. So, I feel like you know, too, Francis, when you made this movie, I think you were making it, too, as, as like a huge invitation and a calling card. Because sometimes we can talk about these ideas, but it's when you can actually see things acted out. Sometimes, in a, in, even in a character in a, in a movie that you're watching, or a character in your life, and I think that's what happened with Jesus and the Apostles. And when Jesus was walking as, as a dream figure 2,000 years ago, that there's something inside Mary Magdala, there was something inside the Apostles that just went, oh, it's, it can be simpler. It can be relaxed. It can be friendly. It can be easygoing. It doesn't have this striving and this push. Jesus wasn't political. He wasn't trying to overthrow the Romans. He, he wasn't trying to shake up society. He wasn't trying to shake up the world. I think his simple message, really, he, he was so calm and, and relaxed and friendly because he simply knew that he didn't have to try to make anything of the world different that he could come into this huge acceptance and just let all things be exactly as they are because he could see that they were unreal effects. It was just a projection and he would rather stay home with Papa, stay home and centered in his heart with Abba Father, stay home at God, stay resting in God instead of trying to fix and change an illusory world that was only made as a veil to blind you from knowing who you are. And I would have to say, I mean, that's part of why we're showing the movie, that's part of our lives. For, for Francis, myself, for other people in our community, we're simply here to learn to be still and relax and trust that we don't have to try to judge or figure out anything that seems to be happening in the dream. We're perfectly content to rest. We're perfectly content to be passers-by with this world. We're perfectly content to see all the synchronicities, see everything orchestrated, and 
to not try to split, the, split it up into something has gone right or something has gone wrong. We don't have goals. You know, we can't really identify with, with a ministry because if it's all our mind, it can't be a ministry. We can't really identify with, with something that has a shape or a size because that's just another concept. It's just this, a friendly, joyful, laughing, happy state of mind. It's carefree. It's absolutely carefree. And it doesn't, it's not dependent on any outcomes of the world. A war breaks out. You know, I've actually been on teaching tours when I've been seemingly traveling around the United States and the world. And I was so much into the glee of Jesus, I have to say, that I was out on the road. This happened a number of times, too, because there have been quite a few wars over the last, uh, skirmishes over the last uh, three decades. But I was out, and I was so much into the glee of my function and sharing the good news and sharing my happiness that I actually would show up at some gatherings and they'd say, what do you think about the war? And I would say, what war? And they'd say, a war just broke out. And I, I was... I was oblivious to the wars. I do remember that during 9-11, when the, when the towers came down, there were people on 9-11, back there in 2001, that were on camping trips, vacations, they were out in nature, they were out in Yosemite, or out in the Muir Woods, or out in far, far off and everything, and they just continued right on with their happy vacation because they, they had no contact with, with radio waves or anything that was going on. And then I would talk to some people and they would say, oh my God, that brought up the greatest terror that there were people that were actually living in the United States that were unaware of attack, unaware of the towers, unaware of anything. It scared them that there were people that were unaware of, of, of the towers coming down. And I just burst into laughter. I thought, that's the height of, that's exactly how the ego is. It's got to have something to be concerned about. Something to be worried about. But if you go into a state of meditation, what do you think you're going to find? You're going to find light, is what you're going to find. If you go deep enough into meditation, you're going to find blazing light, not a light of this world, but a light of who you are. And the perceptual world, you're not even going to give a thought to the seeming projected conflicts from your own mind that you once believed in. So this is basically the teaching of A Course in Miracles, that quantum physics and The Course in Miracles teach the same thing. There is no world apart from what you think. Francis was just saying, you have to change your thinking in order to be happy. It's just, happiness is just natural, it's real, but as long as you're thinking with the ego, you don't know it. In quantum physics, there's no world apart from the consciousness, so if you forgive, if your consciousness, consciousness becomes unified and holistic, then the perceptual nightmare of this world, you, you see, that was a figment of imagination. That was just a figment of ego imagination. This is deep stuff, because what it's telling you is, if you listen and follow to the Spirit, you will be in a state of mind that is not codependent on the ego. You will be dependent only on the divine love and light of the Spirit, and the perceptual hallucination of this world will, will dissolve and collapse into holistic perception. I can tell you because it's happened for me. I mean, I'm not just trying to be optimistic with you. I'm, I'm actually telling you that this is real. This is the realest thing that you can experience in time and space is, is this unified perception. And Francis is just sharing, too, this is just the example of listen and follow. She had a dream, she was told a movie would be made, and then about 
five and a half, six years later, it starts to, she starts to witness it in the dream, and now the, the, the movie is being used in the dream world as part of a, a wake-up call. And yeah, it's, this is really good news. <laughs> Yeah, and I think, I think um, you know, it, it, it. I was talking a little bit about the length of this uh, fr project from the beginning till now. It, it seemed to go through eight years, but I can tell you how much time during these eight years I was told to do nothing, like l literally do nothing. The first six years I was told to to be patient because he told me the movie was already made. And it's not going to be through my effort. So it was six years of waiting. And then um, I just remembered one thing at the very end of my editing, because I it took me uh, over a year and a half just in the editing room to put about 300 hours of footage and pick them and then uh, put them together. And at one point, the goal started to to sneak into my mind to make a good movie so that it has a story arc. Um, it is very clear. It is presented well. So, so I started to look at the characters in the movie and I started to think how to present them in a way that this movie will be perceived as a really good product. And, and, now looking back from that moment on, I started to go off in a very long detour because it would just go try, 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 try different things until at the end, I feel so drained of inspiration. My inspiration just died, just faded, faded, faded till the point that I was going to let it go because it was not going to be made. I did not feel inspired anymore. And then that was almost, I think it could, could take about a year and five months out of the year and a half. And then um, one day I was going to just let it go. I heard in my mind, Jesus said, you don't need to rearrange the story. I already did in that month. You just put it together according to the day it happened. And that's it. You don't need to. And I'm like, really? He said, yeah, I arranged it. You don't need to do anything. <laughs> so I thought, well, that's all, that's, that, I, that means I don't need to do anything because I have all the footage marked by the date and I already picked certain ones that touch me according to the date. So all I need to do is to put them in the timeline. You, you said my job is done, but I spent a year and five months and you're saying my whole work can be done within weeks. And he said, yeah, why do you take all this effort to do something I will do for you? And I was just thinking, wow, you know, if, if time is spent to learn this lesson, then I would say I can see the purpose of it. But that's why Jesus says in the Course that time, miracles is here to save time because I didn't have to. And yet, you know, there is no real consequence because the lesson that needs to be, be learned will be learned. It is learned. What is the lesson? You know, just focus on present goal of being with the spirit and let all else go. And you cannot have two goals at the same time. And that is a hard lesson I have to learn over and over and over and over again. Because all the, 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 the subtle lessons of thinking, yeah, I want this to heal my mind and that's it. But then are you willing to let it all go? Are you willing to not have a project? But I am doing a project. So it's, it's facing all these subtle um, separate goals. And that's why I feel when he said, put um, the first, seek first the kingdom of heaven, all else will be added unto you. And that is absolutely no wiggle room about it in my mind. Because if I 
put something else and the kingdom ha- kingdom of heaven together, I do not have peace of mind. I feel internal conflict with absolutely every decision I have to make because the decision, the end goal for the decision are split and are in conflict. Then all the decisions are in conflict with each other. I do not know what I'm deciding for anymore. I do not know how to make the right decision anymore. So that is the lesson that I feel. That's why I started this by saying, we're all really just learning one lesson, but we have to learn it over and over again. But if I look at everything in this way, it makes sense. Why why our project here? Why do we work? Why do we do anything? Why are we in a relationship? We are here to learn this one lesson. The lesson that to give is to receive. There is an innocence that you can perceive. And that is through the spirit perspective. And that is has to be learn over and over again. I feel that's what time is for. That is what everything is for. And that is, actually, I feel that is hope because then we don't have to feel, look at our lives and feel hopeless. We don't have to look at our relationships and our things as hopeless. I don't know the way out. But if we know the purpose of their very existence, then all we perceive is purpose, 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 purpose. And I think that's that's something that we will um, emphasize again and again throughout this weekend. And and this is what you can focus on during the movie as well. And in the movie, we you will see people having, you know, it is a, a movie about relationships because it is very much about using relationships to um, to heal the separation and heal the mind and to to dare to reach that place that we're one mind so that we're op- we, we dare to open up to each other to share very intimate thoughts um, to to heal the the private thoughts and to be very, very trusting and transparent with each other. So you will see that theme in the movie, but you will also see that, you know, without this purpose, things don't make any sense in, in this world and in relationships. Why, why roles start to shift? Why, you know, when parents and children, they have, they have conflicts or they have different opinions, what what is everything for what is everything for and you will see in this movie because all the characters came to the monastery in utah our um, living miracles monastery for a 30-day stay and everybody showed up for this one purpose let me just use whatever happens as a means to heal the mind as a means to get back to forgiveness and to the spirit, then you will see if, if this goal is up front, then there is nothing that doesn't make sense anymore. You understand why roles, um, preferences, separate interests will all fade away because they all have to yield to this one lesson we see there is no separate interest anymore. We see that, you know, to by giving innocence, I receive innocence. We see that giving and receiving are the same. We see that spirit is guiding both of us, is in both of us. So that is really um, exciting to be able to live in this purpose and to actually to be able to show relationships that are offered to this purpose and what will happen and one thing you know if you watch this movie and seeing that is the purpose of the relationship then you will be able to see you will be able to transfer it to your life and see that okay all the relationships in my life can be used for the very same purpose 
there is no real need to separate anything anymore. We can u- unify the purpose. Then it becomes extremely simple. You know, we just call on the spirit to tell us how to act in terms of form in each and every day. But in terms of thinking, it is our own choice to give to the spirit our mind and let the form be guided. However, however it is going to be, it's very, very individualized. But the lesson is just universal. It's the same lesson. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know that in this lifetime, that seems to be the parable of David, that uh, uh, the parents of David said, well, the, we named you after a, a character in the Bible. And I said, David? Yeah, they, they, we named you after King David. And then I remember digging around in the Old Testament to check out what this uh, David had, had done or written. But I remember reading the Psalms, the Psalms of David. Some of you might remember the 23rd Psalm from uh, the Bible, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, if that was the only line in the Bible, you could get by with that one line. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The problem is, is wanting. The The problem is, is the ego has taken our powerful mind, our beautiful, powerful Christ mind, and it's it's an illusion, it's a trick of hijacking the mind, the mind believing something other than uh, forgiveness. And then once that, that mind is hijacked by the ego, that's where those things that Francis just mentioned, those, those preferences come in. Preferences are wants. Um, needs are, are actually wants. Uh, things of this world, anything... Jesus tells us anything that you value of this world will hurt you. Anything. Because it's valuing something more than who you are. If you're pure spirit and you were created whole and complete, you were created without lack. You were created without wants. So the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That means all you can do is, is start to take a look at everything that you think you want. And let, you know, do like a 12-step inventory on it. Let's do an inventory on all the wants. Because we got it already in the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So first you do an inventory on everything that you want. And you just let it rise up. I, I want a spiritual partner who's on the same pathway that's me. I want a spiritual career. I, I want... Whatever it is, you know, I want a house, I want a car, I want uh, a lifestyle of like this. Whatever it is, just let it up. I want this, I want this, I want this. But if the Lord is my shepherd, that's the key point right there, is, is if you give over your wants to the Holy Spirit or to Jesus, that's going to be the best decision that you've ever made. Because if you give it to the one who knows your happiness, who knows what you truly want underneath all of the ego desires, if you give that over to the Spirit, then the Spirit will use that in your listen and follow procedure. All your instructions, all your directions, everything that you get will be part of that unwinding away from the want. Wouldn't it be great if you had a state of mind where you were just so happy and so peaceful and so content, you were just so joyful that you you couldn't even come up with a want? You know, what do you want for Christmas? I I've got everything. I am everything. I don't really need a I don't need presents for Christmas because I have presents. I am presents. You see, it's a lot different between wanting presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S, versus I am presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. It's, it's a big difference. So the key to this, just like with Francis, you know, 
she's told you you're going to be making a movie in the dream. Don't do anything. Just be patient. It's already done. Isn't that relaxing? If 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 I told you that everything that you will seem to do in this awakening is already done, it's already part of a prearranged plan, and it's like you just have to get your hands off the wheel. Don't try to steer the car, just get your hands off the wheel. In fact, it's better to get away from that wheel. Step aside, please, from the wheel. Get in the passenger seat. <laughs> you, you'll be much happier in the passenger seat than trying to actively control the direction of your life in time and space. Because why? Because it's all part of a prearranged plan anyway, and, and you're not an active participant in any of it. You want to activate your, your right mind. You want to activate to find your real thoughts that are buried underneath all these attack thoughts and judgments. You want to be in, in joy and just be a passers-by with this world. The fun part is, is how everything, you just watch it and things seem to, everything gets taken care of, taken care of, including things that just fall away. Wouldn't it be better to free yourself from the belief in loss, the belief in rejection, the belief in abandonment, and then when something seems to shift on the screen or disappear, you could just have a very gentle, bye-bye, thank you, thank you for for however long you were there, that was beautiful. I, oh, thank you. I kiss you goodbye. Wouldn't it be great is if something started to disappear from your dream world, you could kiss it goodbye and thank it for what it offered you. Because the only thing that has value now in your mind is forgiveness. Nothing else has value. The only thing that has value it's that's, that's why Jesus talks like a broken record for all those 12, 1,200 pages about forgiveness. Because why? He knows it's the only thing left that has value. Jesus says forgiveness is the one illusion that leads out of all the rest. Wouldn't you want that one illusion if it was going to take you out of all the rest and take you back to the kingdom of heaven within? That's important. So I would say, when I look at all the different questions and things that you've written in and things that you've done, things that you wish you were different, um, I mean, a lot of the questions, I have to say, some of these, Octavio, you know, my gosh, Octavio wrote out this prayer, and hopefully I'll get a chance to read it because it's just the most beautiful prayer. And then Tim Reagan in Hawaii he wrote out a prayer, and I just had tears in my eyes, like reading the prayer, because it's everything is here. Our job is forgiveness through mind training. Our job is not to achieve anything in the illusion. Our job is not to save ourselves from some illusory threat. Think of all the energy that goes into trying to protect the body and, and survival of the body. The story is what the story is. Nothing. Our job is not to change the story. Our job is to use the story to identify the blocks to love's presence so that we might offer them to the Holy Spirit for correction. Thank you, Tim Reagan from Hawaii. I mean, my gosh, this is the most beautiful prayer because the prayer is not asking for the world to be different. The prayer is not defining problems in the world, and then forgetting about forgiveness so that you can go on some kind of circuitous delay maneuver route to try to solve some non-existent problem. I mean, I feel like what this movie is and what this weekend is, really, to me, this is, this is my invitation. Please join me in this forgiveness party. <laughs> Please come to the party. I mean, I look at all of you, I see your faces, and to me, you are me. I don't think of anything else. I'm not thinking that anything's going wrong in the world or things need to be fixed in the world. I'm just looking at you, and I'm seeing you and all of us as holistic aspects of, of the very same one. 
Wouldn't you rather live a life without problems? Because that's what life is. Life wasn't created by God to be problematic. When, it said when God created, it was good. He didn't, it didn't say God created and went, oops, there's a problem out there. <laughs> you know? That doesn't say much for God. If God is, God is creating, oops, you know, or worse, you know, it's like, who, why, why would we even think that God would even be like that? God is a God of pure love. So I, I do invite you, I mean, I, I hope we actually have the time to get through a lot of the prayers and the questions, but, but I invite you to not limit your prayers. This weekend, I want you to pray with all your heart, but don't put any limits and parameter of, on it by what you think you're worthy of or what you think you deserve. If you, if you want a spiritual partnership, what's stopping you? I mean, your mind is so powerful, then don't accept anything less than the reflection of your own divinity. If, if you feel like there's things in this world that are holding you back, then bring it back to your mind and go, what is it that I think about myself? that is determining this limit that I perceive in my environment, or in my body, or in my partnerships and relationships. In a workbook lesson of A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, everything I think and say and do teaches all the universe. And before we came on with you tonight, Francis and I were on the phone and we were just, I was just rejoicing in this idea that there aren't any limits in situations. There's no limits in time and space. If I'm the Holy Christ and I accept that in my prayer, if I say, show me, show, reveal to me my identity, and then I can safely let go of trying to see anything as outside my mind or control things, control people, control, manipulate situations. Why would you want to manipulate a situation when situations don't even exist? You know, that's still part of the fragmented thinking, much less manipulating and controlling them. When you start to come back into your mind, you start to realize you have everything. You are everything. And the things that you were so concerned about were simply things that you were still holding on to apart from love. You were still saying, no God, I, I'm, I'm limited here and I've got to deal with these things. And Jesus is like saying, you know, no, give it to the Holy Spirit. Give it, give it over and see how expansive your mind feels when you do. So, we're going to go through the movie and we'll also go through some of these questions because, because every time we see a problem in the world, it simply means that our mind would rather be right about specialness than forgiveness. Every time we see a problem anywhere in time and space, in any person, place, thing, in any body, in any molecule, in any electron, if we see a problem in anything of time and space, it's like behind that in our mind, it's like we're saying, nah, hold off there on forgiveness, you know, I, I still want to believe in a little bit of specialness, and for me to be special and unique and different from God, and special and unique and different from Christ, I'm going to have to keep inventing problems to prove that I'm right about my tiny identity, my personality self, instead of forgiving my personality self and the world and just opening to the magnitude. I had a friend who just wrote to me uh, this afternoon from Canada, and she said, I'm just so terrified of the magnitude. 
I've gone through these, these shifts and changes and I'm just so terrified. And I just said, thank you for pouring your heart out. I'll join you. I join you now in the truth. And another friend I had a, a conversation with over Skype and it was the same thing. It was like, I'll join you in the truth of, of what's real and what's true. That's what true empathy is about. Not joining in false problems, not jo joining in false beliefs and false thoughts and concepts. I join you in the truth. If you keep that practice up, you will find yourself getting happier and happier and happier. Because the truth is happiness. When, when you are in alignment with the truth, you are not compromising in the least bit. And any time you feel a sense of conflict or compromise in your mind, all you need to do is pause and say, this is not for me. I, over the, right before Christmas, I went um, to see a, a movie that was released based on actual events from 1943, 1939 to 1943. And the name of the movie was called Hidden Life. Hidden Life. And it was based on a farmer in Austria who's living in the hills, the mountains of Austria. Uh, it's so beautiful. I think Katarina's on here with us today. Austria, it's a, it's a husband and a wife and they're three daughters and they're living in a little village in Austria and it's so happy, happy and they just, there's so much joy and happiness in the family and then the Nazis from Germany basically send people down basically to say you have, we need you to be in, in the, the army. And so they take away all the men, the farmers, and they, they have them for a while. Well, the whole movie is about this one farmer who at some point, as he's going through this whole experience with the war and with everything, at some point it just doesn't feel right. Uh, white supremacy or the Aryan race supremacy doesn't feel right. Killing innocent people doesn't feel right. Uh, trying to take over countries. It doesn't feel right. And yet, everybody in his village is kind of like, well, don't rock the boat. You know, like, go along. You, you know, what, are you going to bring down the fury of the Nazis on our heads? Don't, just go along with it. Go along with it. Go along with it. But the whole movie is how this man, his, his, the main character's name is Franz, he starts to realize that he can't compromise on that feeling inside and he has to go for what he feels. So he starts to just basically not agree to support the Nazis, to support anything about the war, to support anything at all that doesn't resonate with his feelings of Jesus and with the Bible and with what he's learned is true, what is true I mean true eternally, love, anything that is inconsistent with love, he will not uh, go for. Eventually, he is he's killed by the Nazis because of his disobedience, because he will not just kowtow and, and do whatever they say. In the end, it's not even worth, his body he sees is worthless to him, if his soul is not at rest, if he's not in alignment with, with the source, if he's not in alignment with the love and the truth, what good is a body? You know, he'll just be a tortured soul going through the motions. And I think this is pretty much the same thing what Jesus is guiding us with in the Course. He's like saying, listen, you've, you've believed in the body. You think the body's your home. And you think the body is your existence, but it's not. It's simply a learning device that can be used by the Holy Spirit to unlearn the ego. That's all the Holy Spirit and Jesus see the body as. The body has no value in and of itself. It's certainly not made of anything that's eternal. There's no value in flesh. It's very temporary. Here one day, gone the next. But your mind and your awakening mind is so important that that body is only a learning device, or we could even say an unlearning device, 
to help you unlearn everything in your mind that you've stuffed over the truth. Everything that you've programmed on top of the truth, that you've stacked on, has to be peeled. The layers have to all come off. And the body is just a device that can be used for that. It has no value whatsoever except as a device to undo the ego. And when you have unlearned the ego, then you can lay the body aside just as happily and easily as taking off a sweater or a shirt or a blouse. You don't have to have a big, you don't have to grieve that you're letting go of a body. You're, you, it served its purpose to undo the ego. Then you can gently, gracefully lay it aside. Isn't that the way you would want to lay aside the body? Instead of gnashing of teeth and, and grinding of emotions, of grief and, and guilt, wouldn't you rather happily lay it aside? Like you were laying aside a garment that had just served its purpose. So that's really why we're joining here is because every time you put too much faith in the body, you have stress. You bring stress onto your mind, you bring concern, you bring guilt, you bring fear, you bring feelings of, of loss and abandonment. You take all of hell onto your mind by valuing something that, that basically has no value whatsoever. If it doesn't come from God, it, in the end, it, it doesn't have any value. And when you look for any kind of value in this world, you have to look for how it serves your awakening to God. You don't want to put it, you don't want to put the body through all these hoops of having to do all these crazy things, earning money for senseless things and then consuming and tossing them away for more senseless things. And, you know, Consumerism is, uh, is a great ego invention to distract you away from be still and know who you really are. Materialism is a big distraction from be still and know who you are. Even I look around at these cameras and this studio and these lights, what purpose would they have except to extend glee and happiness and joy? What purpose could, could cameras and and chairs and cups and monitors and lights have, have to do with anything in heaven except to radiate that joy, to be a blessing, to inspire and to bless. So, you know, this is really important stuff, but, you know, you can see where we really need to, to be honest with each other. We really need to pour this out because we need examples, we need witnesses, and above all, we need to have a relaxing trust where we say, God is going to handle, the Spirit will handle everything. I don't even have to figure out how I'm going to get back because I never really left and so it can't be that the how is that difficult when you never really left. It must be a little tweak in the mind. It must be the tiniest, simplest tweak in your mind, in your perception, in your purpose that that unleashes the, the glory of, of love and light. <laughs> That's beautiful. Maybe I could just, you know, I, I keep talking about this prayer, these prayers. You know, I feel like that's what this, this is for. And I, I want to read this prayer that Tim Reagan wrote in from Hawaii because it's titled The Prayer of Remembrance. And isn't that a beautiful title for a prayer? We are at home in the arms of God. We are asleep dreaming that we are not. Our acceptance of the dream as real has us believing that it is. In reality, there is no past and no future. There is nothing happening but a projection of the one mind. In our commitment to remembering that this is a projection, is not real, is not us, we declare this to be the only day there is. Nothing happened before this day and nothing will happen after this day. Oh, Tim, I have to tell you, when I'm just reading that, I'm like thinking, what a great exercise for all of us to go into. that that this is the only day that we have. 
You know, it's a, it's a version of this is the only moment, but this is, is the only day. Right here, right now, all of us joining together on the internet like this, in this uh, retreat, is a quantum joining where we're focused so on the here and now. And if you're honest, you will admit that all of your problems were in the past or in the future. That actually, right now, this instant, we don't really have any problems. I hope you can feel that. I do. I, I'm sure feeling it. I've had people try to convince me their problems sometimes, and we sit and talk, and I just, I don't get it. I, I don't really see a problem there. And then I read to you the other part about our job is forgiveness through mind training. But he goes on later on to say, we acknowledge that in this moment we are exactly where we need to be with exactly the right tools to do what we need to do. So Holy Spirit, give us our orders for today. Tell us exactly what to do, what to say, and what to think. Tell us who, what, where, and when, and we will do it. We will do it, and it will be used by the collective to remember who we are in truth, that we might get home to God. In acceptance of you as guide, Holy Spirit, we disavow the ego's voice and embrace yours. By following your guidance, we declare the separation, the illusion, the ego, and the selves we have made to be unreal. And then Octavio wrote another prayer too. It was so beautiful because all these prayers are just prayers of trust to just listen and follow. In the sweetness of love for Jesus, I want to make myself aware that the unconscious does not exist. I want to make myself aware that the blindness and disease are non-existent. I want to become aware that the peace of God reigns in my mind and that the threat of unconscious fear is not from the kingdom of God and it disappears in the light. Jesus, I want to give myself to you in the love that unites us, in the Father that always is in my heart. May your voice be his in, my, in me that guides me and fills my mind with thoughts of God. This is a request I make to you, Jesus, which comes from the bottom of my heart so that peace and serenity remain in my heart and accompany me through a bright path in which I know that I am spirit and that strength and peace are always with me. These are just snippets from the, the beautiful prayers. And what does that mean practically to give yourself over to spirit? It just means that you just admit that you're not in control of what seems to be this world or your life in this world. It just means you admit that you have a perceptual problem, but you're willing to have perception rearranged so you can see the world truly. It also is like the, those last five lessons that, that uh, Francis talked about at the very last five lessons of the 365. This holy instant, what I give to you, be you in charge or I would but follow. We're getting prepared for the new year where Jesus is telling us, let make this year different by making it all the same. Wouldn't it be wonderful to see every single moment and every single minute of every day and every month of 2020 to see them all the same? to not judge anything positively or negatively, to not rejoice over an outcome or despair over an outcome. What if your New Year's resolution was to be in love with everyone and make no distinctions in the attitude that you feel towards every single brother and sister that you perceive and that crosses your mind? Were you simply are going to go for agape love as your New Year's resolution. No, you're not going to 
value a partner or a husband or a wife or a child or a neighbor above any other person, place, thing in, in the world. Maybe you could just admit I was wrong about the categories. I, I thought I had close friends and best friends. I thought I had confidants. I thought I, I had dear ones. I, I thought I could come up with a concept called loved ones where some people were loved and then some people were just something else, indifferent or not loved. You know, I'm tired of playing the game of just holding up a few people as being loved ones, you know, and thinking my happiness and my life depends on a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a partner, a family. What if I take the lid off of that specialness and I say, I don't know how, but I want you to show me a love that embraces everyone, that includes everyone, where no one is excluded from that love. I want to have a love this new year where whoever calls me, I don't care if they're calling to, to solicit and try to get me to buy something, I'm going to have a loving attitude with them if they call me. If I answer the phone and they try to sell me something, I'm going to share the love in my heart with them. If, if somebody comes to the door, if I meet somebody, if somebody emails me, I'm not just going to dismiss and disregard and discard. I'm going to be looking at everything that happens as my opportunity to accept my one lesson, which is total inclusion. In this world, it's very strange that we have love and exclusivity put together. February 14th in the United States, I don't know about other countries, but in February 14th it's Be My Valentine. I was down in Colombia one time. I, I, I was down there and, and I, I actually was taken on a trip down there and they said, well, this is kind of like uh, your Valentine's Day up in the United States, but it's what we do is we buy candy and chocolates and we give them out to everybody not just to one special person. So I went around in Colombia, I took air, air flight, and I was giving it out to children, to generals in airports, a military base where I landed, and I was giving it to mothers, and, and everywhere I went, we just had a big bag of candy, and we gave candy to everybody with a big joyful smile. You know what? That just blew Valentine's Day as I knew it out of the water. That concept in Colombia was like way, way beyond Valentine's Day. Romantic, special, special gifts for special people, special loves while others are disregarded and not cared for. That's not the way Jesus loves. Jesus is not interested in that. If, if specialness is the ego substitute for agape, universal, unconditional love, we must see that specialness is what generates every problem that we have. Did I give enough? Was I a good enough partner or husband? You know, was I a good enough father or mother? Or did I honor my father and mother? You know, we're always walking on eggshells because we've got so much specialness concepts going on in our mind and we're, we're adhering to the specialness of the ego and it's no wonder that we feel guilty, that we feel unworthy, that we feel less than. It's no wonder that our bodies seem to break down and get sick and old and die, is because that's what specialness makes. It makes a temporary world where nothing lasts forever. Things, bodies are gone, we call it birth. Bodies are gone again, they come in, they're born. They, they, we call it death when they disappear. Why should we be so upset with the ephemeral? It's all temporary. There's nothing everlasting about any of perception. And why would God even create something temporary? If God is eternal, why would eternity have any interest in making up the temporary? You know, it doesn't make any sense. 
All our love songs point, I love you forever. We're always yearning for continuity. We're always yearning for continuity. And you know what Jesus tells us? The only place, the only way we find the continuity, the consistency, the loyalty, the continuity that we're yearning for is in the present moment. He even goes so far to say, Jesus says, do not attempt to force continuity onto time. Force. Whenever we're trying to maintain things in the world, we're trying to force continuity on something that the ego made up. But the ego doesn't even know what continuity is. It just makes a bunch of images to keep us distracted from knowing who we are. And that's why the last five lessons of the Course are this holy instant, what I give to you, be you in charge. Resign now as your own teacher. Jesus tells us that. He says, you have taught what you are, but you have not allowed what you are to teach you. Why not allow the Holy Spirit, which is God's reminder of who we are, let the Holy Spirit be the teacher instead of trying to have a personal guide, a personal egoic guide that's trying to tell you who you are and who everything is. So I agree with Francis. I think the, the greatest thing you can do and the greatest lesson that Francis learned through this whole movie process was, was to let go of the reins. Don't try to control the project. Don't try to control the world. Don't try to control the life that you believe you have. But do focus your whole energy in your mind on forgiveness. If you can just forgive and release, you will be indescribably happy. Indescribably happy. Unimaginably happy. Because you've just let go of trying to control something that you have no control over. Jesus says you have no control over the world you made. If you go back to the rules for decision section, it's a beautiful line. That's a mantra. You have no control over the world you made. So we're zooming in to the end. I, I feel we just lit the fire. In fact, we did more than put a little kindling under the logs. I think we we have a bonfire going on the first night. <laughs> That's the way I feel. My, I feel like I'm so lit up here. And then tomorrow we're going to get more, I think, into more uh, interactivity with, with what you've shared with us. And Francis, why don't you give us a little sneak, sneak peek. We have a, a couple, two or three minutes left before we, we launch into our evenings here. Yeah. Yeah, that was so so deep, and I was, I I feel like you know you mentioned the prayer, David, and I think that is actually um, a good way to end tonight. If if you all take a, a couple of minutes to set a prayer in your mind, because this is tomorrow. You see the movie. Uh, that is how the the movie crew and we all started the movie with we started with a prayer and we forget about our prayer and then we just see how everything almost started to run on the autopilot in terms of the universe come together to answer that prayer you know a lot of us have to be reminded two years later that, oh, I said a prayer because I captured it on camera. So I know everybody's prayer and then they forget themselves. But it was so unbelievably amazing how every single prayer was answered, not to the way that we select how it should be answered, how, who should answer us and in what way. But inevitably, it is the most loving way this prayer is answered. So I will just feel like I will invite you to, to just, yeah, spend a couple of minutes just to invite the spirit or have a, a little dialogue with the spirit in your mind and 
just really share what feels authentic right now in your heart with him. What is the desire? Even if you can't find the words, that's still okay because spirit knows uh, the desire of the heart. Okay, thank you so much for tonight and for joining us. And I, I just, yeah, I hope you, you will hold this prayer. And when you watch the movie tomorrow, you see, you will see on screen how spirit will lovingly answer everybody's prayer. And then that will give you some perspective, confidence, and some faith that everything will be answered without your effort. It's all going to be orchestrated. So yeah, so let's just meet tomorrow in the morning. There will be another very, very deep session to answer some of the questions in terms of practical application. But thank you so much. Mm -hmm.